The reading from, for this morning is from Paul's letter to the Corinthians. But for right now, friends, I am completely frustrated by your unspiritual dealings with each other and with God. You're acting like infants in relation to Christ, capable of nothing much more than nursing at the breast. Well, then, I'll nurse you since you don't seem capable of anything more. As long as you grab for what makes you feel good or makes you look important, are you really much different than a babe at the breast, content only when everything's going your way? When one says, I'm on Paul's side, and another says, I'm for Apollos, aren't you, aren't you being totally infantile? Who do you think Paul is anyway? Or Apollos, for that matter? Servants, both of us. Servants who waited on you gradually, as you gradually learned to entrust your life to, the, to our mutual master. We each carried out our servant assignment. I planted the seed. Apollos watered the plants, God, but God made you grow. It's not the one who plants or the one who waters who is at the center of this process, but God who makes all things grow. Planting and watering are menial servant jobs at minimum wage. What makes them worth doing is the God we are serving. You happen to be in God's field in which we are working.
Powerful, powerful. Thank you, thank you, choir. In today's scripture, the latest in our sermon series on what the opening chapters of what of Paul's first letter to the Corinthians might have to teach us, Paul changes course. As we saw last week, Paul's native tongue, as it were, is more often than not to write densely and abstractly as he makes complicated and nuanced theological arguments. Despite his self-effacing claim that he came to Corinth and founded the church using no fancy rhetoric, the evidence is otherwise. And that's not a bad thing. For think about our day. Twitter, with its limitation of 140 characters per message per tweet, has shown us that important discussions about both public policy and the meaning of Christian life are shortchanged as discussion turns into diatribes and as gotchas become the goal instead of civil discussion. Over-simplistic expressions of the faith can be both misleading and destructive. You only have to listen to some of the well-meaning but theologically horrid things that people say, well-meaning people say to parents who have lost a child to know that sometimes simplicity is hurtful. Oversimplified slogans such as the one we've no doubt all seen, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. They do a terrible injustice to both the richness of the gospel and the ambiguity and complexity of human life. And such slogans encourage us to be mindless in our faith even when certain expressions of that faith seem to suggest that God is a tyrant or a bully. As Galileo once famously said, himself a victim of oversimplistic theology, quote, I do not believe that the same God who has endowed us with reason and intellect intends for us to forego their use. So, to my mind, Paul need not apologize for the way he thoughtfully, if sometimes complicatedly, seeks to share his faith in Jesus. For a faith that can be captured in the space of a tweet or in the confines of a bumper sticker or in the words of a slogan just won't prove to be very helpful when life is hard and hurtful. When questions come our way as they will, when sleepless 3 a.m. moments have us wondering if God truly cares. In today's scripture, though, Paul takes a breath, as it were, from such complexity and seeks to illustrate what he has been saying with two metaphors. And with those two metaphors, he adds to his resume the title not just of apostle, but now that of dietitian and horticulturist as well. There are two main themes, remember, in these opening chapters of 1 Corinthians. First, the situation where the Corinthians are bickering with each other about which leader among them should be the most influential. And second, Paul's description of what he calls the foolishness of the cross 
as truly showing the nature of God. In our verses today, he returns to the Corinthians bickering and offers this dietitian metaphor. And while Eugene Peterson's translation sometimes goes well beyond translation and into paraphrase, his rendering here does capture Paul's exasperation and annoyance. Hear it again. I'm completely frustrated with you, Paul says, by your unspiritual dealings with each other and with God. You're acting like infants in relation to Christ, capable of nothing more than nursing at the breast. Well then, I'll nurse you since you don't seem capable of anything more. What's Paul's point? with his shift to this metaphor. Well, first, he's telling the Corinthians that those who are new to the faith indeed need a simple, but never over-simple or simplistic understanding of the gospel, and that those who would make fun of such folks are bullies. When you are new, when you are new to any endeavor, you need simple. When I was first learning to fly, my instructor wisely had me concentrate on just one thing, trying to keep the plane going in a straight line. Instead of immediately adding in all the other complexities that are needed if you're going to be a proficient pilot, such as holding your altitude, that's kind of crucial, and going in the direction that you actually intended to go, that's important as well, and communicating with air traffic control and on and on. When you're new to the gospel, simple is good. Jesus loves me, this I know, is a wonderfully and appropriately simple formulation for someone who is new to the faith. But simple food, milk alone, is not enough if we are to grow. One writer puts the point rather charmingly. Listen to her words, quote, the process of maturing in faith, she says, can be a messy business, just as the process of introducing solid food to an infant can be fraught with problems. For, just as a child can mistake pureed vegetables for finger paint, or can misunderstand that nostrils are not the appropriate orifice through which to ingest food, so too our explorations of God's love and message expressed to us in Jesus can sometimes create similar chaos. And chaos is not too strong a word here. For life is inevitably going to bring all of us to those times when Jesus loves me, this I know, all by itself, is just not an adequate diet. Because sometimes you will ask, can he really love me when I have done such an awful thing? Or... What does it matter when life is so beating up on me or in the face of death and grief? We all will inevitably sometimes wonder what difference does it make? And so Paul will go on to say a simple diet of theological milk, the Gerber gospel as one writer put it, will not be enough if you truly want to grow your faith. For 
For if you refuse to eat more and more solid theological food, your growth will be stunted and you will too readily fall victim to those oversimplistic, too often harmful and hurtful things I described earlier. Jesus loves me, this I know remains true throughout our lives, but we must add to it if we are truly to have a mature faith, if we're truly to let God grow us into better Christians. For example, we need, we will need to learn, sometimes painfully, that Jesus doesn't love just me, but he loves a lot of people I don't like. A lot of people who I will be tempted to hate and wall off and dehumanize. We will need to learn that while Jesus indeed loves me, he is not my personal trainer. He is not my good luck charm. He is not my getter of parking spaces. But a savior of tough love who expects us to love our enemies and pray for them even as we seek to hold them accountable to the best instead of pandering to the worst. Now, after Paul's foray into pediatric dietetics, he now becomes a horticulturist. Again, in the context of saying to the Corinthians why they're bickering over which leader they like best is both pointless and harmful to their witness to a needy world. Again, listen to how he puts it. Who do you think Paul is anyway? Or Apollos? Servants, both of us, servants who waited on you as you gradually learned to entrust your lives to our mutual master. I planted the seed, he says. Apollos watered the plant, but God made you grow. It's not the plants or the one who waters, but God who makes things grow. Now, it's always a little ironic of course, for me to preach on agricultural or horticultural images. After all, I have been known to say that the reason that I don't do gardening is because I have not yet found any bacon seeds. <laughs> Be that as it may, Paul's point here goes back to what he's been saying about how the Corinthian and their bickering hurts their witness to the world, their fighting and their fractiousness about who has, as it were, more Facebook likes and more Twitter followers, Paul says, makes the world around them skeptical. Now, there certainly are things that we ought to contend with we ought to contend with each other about as we grow in our faith together. We need, we need to challenge each other to expand our empathies and imaginations about who is our neighbor. We need to always keep talking about how we balance our care for each other with our care for those in the world who don't yet know the God of unconditional love that we know. We need to argue from time to time about how we will best be a community that shows that we truly welcome everyone. Those things will grow us and they will show the world that we care about crucial things, not trivia. But when we squabble about whether our December Starbucks cups ought to be more Christmassy, or when we spend our energies on the silly claim that American Christians are somehow persecuted, then the world rolls its eyes and says, it's not just that they fight. 
It's that they fight about stupid stuff. Why would I want to be a part of that? But Paul's other point with his horticultural metaphor is even more important. He's telling all those on every side, the Apollos lovers, the Peter proponents, the Paul groupies, that they've all profoundly missed the point. One of the goals of Christian life in community is to grow in our faith, to move beyond that simple Gerber gospel. But, such growth cannot happen until we realize that it is God and not any particular person who gives the growth that we need. But perhaps a story will make the point more evocatively. Writer Rachel Remen tells the following story about a childhood encounter with her grandfather. Often when he came to visit, she writes, my grandfather would bring me a present. Once he brought me a little paper cup, I looked inside expecting something special. It was full of dirt. I was disappointed. He smiled at me fondly and turning, he picked up from my doll's tea set the little teapot and filled it with water and Back in the nursery, he put the little cup on the windowsill and handed me the teapot and said, if you promise to put some water in the cup every day, something may happen. At the time, I was four years old, and my nursery was on the sixth floor of an apartment building in Manhattan. The whole thing made no sense to me. I looked at him dubiously. He nodded with encouragement every day, every day. And so I promised. At first, curious to see what would happen, I did not mind doing this. But as the days went by and nothing changed, it got harder to remember to put water in the cup. After a week, I asked my grandfather, is it time to stop yet? All he said was, every day every day. The second week was even harder and I became resentful of my promise to put water in that cup. But I didn't miss a single day. And one morning there were two little green leaves that had not been there the night before. I was completely astonished, she wrote. Day by day they got bigger. I couldn't wait to tell my grandfather because I knew he would be as surprised as I was. <laughs> of course, he was not, she says. Carefully, he explained to me that life is everywhere, hidden in the most ordinary and unlikely of places. And all it needs is water, Grandpa? I asked him. Gently, he said, no, all it needs is your faithfulness. We dare not let our fighting over inconsequential things keep us from witnessing to the foolishness of the gospel. We dare not let our bickering over minutia keep us from fighting against those who would demonize and dehumanize those whom Jesus has told us to call our neighbors. We dare not wall ourselves off from what God is trying to grow in our little cups of dirt for the sake of a needy world. For what God needs Indeed, as Rachel's grandfather said, is our faithfulness and not our fear. What God needs is our confidence and not our cowardice. What God needs is not our eagerness for building barriers, but our work to forge friendships across lines of nation, race, culture and orientation. What God needs is not our excuses, but our energy. What God needs is not our acquiescence to evil, but our resolve for righteousness. 
I planted the seeds, Apollos watered the plants, but God made you grow. It's not the one who plants or waters, but God who makes things grow. How then, how then will you invite God to continue to help you grow?